Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Future of QMS Requirements True Quality Summit Series. This session is going to run for about 35 minutes with about 10 minutes allotted for questions at the end. If you have any questions that come up throughout the presentation, please ask in the Q&A section of the chat. It should be on your right hand side of the Zoom panel there, and we'll get to as many as possible towards the end. We are super excited to have Ed Bills with us today to teach us about risk management and how to implement best practices at your organization. During his 27 year career in medical devices, Ed Bill has held a number of quality regulatory affairs positions. He is an ASQ fellow and is ASQ certified as a quality engineer, quality auditor, and as a manager of quality and organizational improvement. Ed is also Regulatory Affairs Certified through the Regulatory Affairs Professional Society and obtained both a BS and Master's degree from the University of Cincinnati, my hometown, which we were just discussing, so always love a good UC. Ed has also served as U.S. Industry Co-Chair for the Association of Advancement of Medical Instrumentation Committee, QM slash WG04, and on the application of risk management to medical devices, he participated in the development of ISO 14971, a risk management standard for medical devices. Ed is a current member of the ISO Technical Committee on Medical Device Risk Management. And in 2016, he co-edited with Stan Masterangelo, the Lifecycle Risk Management for Healthcare Products from Research Through Disposal, published by Davis Publishing and available at pda.org. But without any further delay, I will go ahead and pass it over to you, Ed, so that we can start learning more about risk. Well, Laura, I guess probably ought to mention Skyline Chili and Geta. <laughs> My personal favorites from Cincinnati, so I'm yeah. sure that'll get some blood boiling for some people with opinions, but I love it. Well, they're, if they don't know Cincinnati, they don't know those two things. But. That is true. <laughs> Anyway, I guess we ought to get on the on the horn here and uh, start talking about moving up to the state of the art in medical device risk management. And um, uh, I throw a few little things in here and there to spice things up. But uh, I do want to uh, take this opportunity uh, while I'm thinking about it. Um, I was asked by the FDA uh, Division of Industry and Consumer Education, DICE, to uh, mention that they have an upcoming um, webinar, uh, uh, two hours, two different sessions in, in a two hour period. Um, I think it's November 14th on risk management. So uh, if you wanna learn about it from their perspective, there's two excellent instructors in uh, DICE there that are doing that program. So I'll, uh, I'll promote that for Joe. Okay. Um, what I want to start with is looking at where we are today and comparing that to where we should be today and then where we need to be tomorrow. That's our uh, uh, agenda today. And uh, one of the things that I uh, start with is mentioning that uh, risk management is not a uh, checkbox activity or documents for to file, it is a product safety process. And what if you were the first patient, how would you perform risk management? Hmm, that's something to think about. Remember, risk management is about the people, the property and the environment. It's not about schedule, it's not about cost. Okay, those are the things that get in the way and making sure we got all those papers in the file. No, it's about people, property, and the environment. So think about how you would perform risk management. It's now uh, November, 2022, and it's three years after uh, the release of ISO 14971, 2019, which was in the uh, December timeframe, early December of, of uh, 2019. Um, so, um, that was the third edition. The first was in 2000, the second was in 2007, and the third in 2019. Uh, in between, um, the uh, uh, standard was, was reaffirmed several times. People didn't want it to be updated uh, or uh, changed, uh, but rather they wanted more information about it. So uh, 
what I have found in doing audits, lots of procedures still point to editions other than the 2019 edition. Procedures are still not up to date with requirements, especially uh, the changes that occurred in uh, production and post-production activities. Notice the word activities. It used to be information, now it's activities. Uh, risk management does not start early enough. Uh, ISO 1345 2016 clause 7.3.3C says that the outputs of risk management are design inputs. So that means we have to have done a number of activities in risk management prior to design input and not later on like a lot of people are doing it. Um, there is either a no or a wrong risk management policy. Uh, a lot of cases, there's no risk management policy. Uh, top management needs to have established a risk management policy. And that tells you what kind of acceptability criteria you're gonna, you're gonna develop. And if you're selling product in Europe, you're gonna have a risk management pro a policy of as low as possible without impacting the benefit to risk ratio. That's going to be your policy for selling in Europe. Uh, many see it as an irritating documentation activity. And my first uh, picture there uh, showed that it's not a documentation activity. In a lot of cases, like I mentioned, product safety takes a backseat to schedule and cost. We have an over-reliance and misunderstanding of FMEA as a risk tool. It's not risk analysis but it is a tool to establish um, faults, uh, conditions in products. And if the fault condition uh, effect is related to safety, then it leads to a hazard. And that's where our risk analysis starts. So after FMEA is where risk analysis starts. There's a lack of understanding of the process, a lack of decision-making skills and good judgment. A lot of medical device risk management is based on judgment. You need expert people to be involved to make those judgments. A lot of the procedures are overly complicated. It's really difficult to slog through uh, some of them. And somebody has a question. What are the key clauses of 14971 for contract design houses who are not the legal manufacturer of any devices? Um, do they need a risk policy? Um, sure they do, uh, because um, they're gonna be responsible for the design risk activities. And the design risk activities are based upon um, the risk policy. So um, uh, contract design houses, um, they need to understand the risk management process because as I said, the outputs of risk management are design inputs. And where do you start? as a contract design house, but developing design inputs. So I hope that uh, answered your question. Okay, um, oh, I'm trying to get rid of the uh, chat and... Uh, uh, the chat is right under we cannot see the chat window. We only see your PowerPoint. I know, it's, but it's covering it up for me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to go back to uh, this one. Um, uh, and, oh, the procedure is over complicated. We finished that. Okay. So another one is a lack of statistically valid data to support quantitative probabilities of harm. Everybody tries to do quantitative probabilities. Well, you can't do it if you don't have statistically valid data to base those quantitative probabilities on. That's why we put qualitative probabilities as allowable in the standard. So if you look at, I think it's clause five, it talks about that. Uh, risk management plans do not contain the risk acceptability criteria or identify the risk review team, because there's a review uh, uh, clause at uh, clause nine, where you do a, a risk management review and you need to know who those people are in the plan before you do it. 
Another problem is the risk management file is not traceable. Uh, clause 4.5 requires traceability and it has some specific elements in it that are identified. It's different from design traceability. So you need to uh, look at that carefully. Um, now, uh, the European community has accepted the uh, amended um, EN ISO 14971 2019 as the harmonized standard for MDR and IVDR. You should be using those documents. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, we have a lack of management support and understanding of risk management's importance to the success of the company. And I have something on a slide there in a moment that I've inserted in this presentation last night. So uh, the only place you'll see it is on this screen. Uh, many have not implemented the, the 2019 version yet and are still on 2007 or worse on EN ISO 14971 2012, which was, uh, had a lot of errors in it. Uh, and um, some people even used something they called ISO 14971 2012, which never existed. If that's in your procedures, get that out of there. Um, the FDA has dropped the acceptability of submissions with a 2007 edition. Uh, they gave us a Christmas gift. That's why the tree's over on the right. On December 25th, they've allowed the, you to use the submissions based on 2007 up until uh, that date. Um, the 2007 edition is no longer acceptable as of December 2022 as ISO has already has also dropped this standard under their normal three-year transition process. And I've got some questions here that people are asking. Um, you seem to have a very dated definition of FMEA. Um, tell you what, uh, I've got uh, the uh, 2018 version of uh, 60812. Um, and um, uh, I am uh, correct on that, Richard. Uh, and the automotive industry has also moved away from um, to their own uh, standard, which has uh, eliminated some of the problems that are in the uh, commonly used one. Uh, what are the key clauses of 14971 con contract design houses? Um, and I mentioned the uh, uh, policy and everything. I answered that one, I hope. George asked, uh, FMEA doesn't meet the requirements for risk management. Can you elaborate on that point? Yes. Um, the risk analysis requires that you um, uh, analyze all faults, not single faults, all faults uh, in normal uh, condition and fault condition, or, uh, excuse me, identify all hazards in normal and fault condition. FMEA does not do fault. FMEA does not do all faults. It's only single fault. So there's a problem with it as well. Um, so uh, errors in 608 in the 2012 version. No, I'm not going to talk about it because it's dead. It's uh, uh, no longer uh, an acceptable document to use. So I'm not going to discuss that old standard. What I'm going to tell you is to erase it from any your procedures now, um, because it's no longer in effect in Europe or uh, anywhere else in the world. Um, okay. Uh, and here's one of the things that, uh, that it did in the 2012 that has been corrected in the MDR, and that is risk control. Uh, it, Information for safety is allowed as a risk control in the MDR. And uh, here was a good illustration I found of uh, information for safety. Um, the poor person that uh, dies from opening this box is also going to be fined 50 euros. So um, there's a yeah, problem there. Um, time is merging on. And in less than 60 days, we need to be fully compliant with 14971-2019. Anything else you got? it needs to be gone by the end of December, okay? Um, here's the slide that I put in here. I read this article, Best Practices in Product Safety Management in Compliance Magazine. 
Um, and it talks about world-class companies spend twice as much money on product safety and have 50% fewer recalls and are four times less likely to have a recall than a less successful company. And that's from a study that was done in 2002. And the conference board also had a list of things on uh, how to establish a product safety function. Um, notice the underlined one there, company-wide safety policy. And that's what the standard requires. Those other things in red are also required by the, the standard. And I mentioned the fact that you need to have full support from top management. You need to have a centralized authority and responsibility for product safety. Well, um, that's kind of focused around the risk management activity um, in uh, medical devices. Uh, involve all company units in product safety. Yes, manufacturing, design, uh, purchasing. Uh, there's a whole raft of people that regulatory need to be involved in product safety. Um, develop an extensive safety database. Yeah, if you've got a, a list of hazards, develop that. Um, and uh, if you're producing, for instance, I worked with a uh, company that made the AEDs, uh, automatic external defibrillators, and they had a standard hazards list that was the starting point for all of their risk analysis, because based upon their experience, they already knew what the majority of the hazards were. There's another great database for um, hazards, and that's your product safety standards. Any hazard that's in a identified in a uh, standard such as 60, uh, 601, the electrical safety standard, <clears throat> is uh, an unacceptable risk. So you can start your risk analysis with that right away. Uh, and then it talks about operating units responsible for safety performance and uh, have the capacity to measure and monitor safety performance. That's a requirement in clause 10 of the standard. So where should we be today? Well, we said already that the um, implementation needs to be by December. Uh, the uh, uh, Unamended version of uh, EN ISO 14971 was recognized as state of the art. So you've had three years, okay, to uh, establish a risk management system. And uh, if you haven't got it done, if you're going to be canceling or uh, delaying, uh, the time is up, okay? Um, Given all that background, you should have been updating your risk management system to the third edition, but many are still not there or all the way there. You should have audited your risk management system and updated it to correct any shortcomings. And that's something you can still do now and, and uh, get back there and make sure that uh, uh, you have got um, the right edition in place because if you're selling into Europe, You've got to use that EN version. If you're selling other places in the world, the ISO version covers everybody else pretty much, except people that require the EN version. I think Australia may be one of those. Um, in uh, 2020, uh, the uh, uh, BSI has a publication called Compliance Monitor. They indicated EN ISO 14971 2019 was the state-of-the-art medical device risk management process standard. At that point in time, the EN version and the identical and the ISO version were identical. They were the same. The only change that has occurred between um, the uh, ISO version and the EN version now is the adding of Amendment 11, which only gave you a uh, Z annex uh, for the, your device. So what is state-of-the-art? Where is it defined? The only definition is in 14971. They use it all over the place in the MDR and, and, and the IBDR, but they don't define it. So how do you understand a term if you don't define it? Here's the definition right out of clause 3.28. And it talks about um, the stage of technical capability given time as regards products. Notice I highlighted processes. Why did I do that? Well, 14971 is a process. It's a risk management uh, system 
that includes processes. So uh, when uh, BSI recognized it, they recognized it on that basis, not on the products because we don't um, uh, we don't have a standard that tells us prescriptively how to how to do a product. We give you a process on how to determine the risk and how to address the risks that you have identified. But it's a process, not a product. Um, and it, it embodies what is currently and generally accepted as good practice. And the green there is important. It does not necessarily imply the most technologically advanced solution. So it's not bleeding edge. OK, it's not way out there on the front, but it's rather generally acknowledged state of the art. It's what state of the art is. So what do we do now? Where, where, how can we get ourselves on track? Well, Annex G in ISO TR 2497120 gives us a hint. And it talks about components and devices designed without using 14971. I would amend that to say without using the latest edition of 14971. First thing it tells you to do is find the gaps, to perform audits, to be critical. Okay, find all the problems that you have. And then second, establish a planned update and identify who's responsible, the dates, the criticalities, the reviews and the projects that need to be done to um, get that done. And finally, monitor the progress, make changes in the plan as required. Everybody knows that when we establish a plan initially, that's not at the end what the plan looks like. It's changed several times. So make sure that you do that. Um, the requirements are all the same in all versions of, of the third edition. The scope, people don't read the scope. Read the scope, it's got important information in it. It tells you that it's not a business risk standard. It's not a standard for uh, project risk, okay? It is uh, a standard that uh, doesn't cover clinical risk. Okay, that is the clinical decision making. The, the healthcare provider makes the decision on the appropriate use of the device. We just tell them, here's the risk on the use of the device. And they assess the patient and determine if this is the right device for that patient or not. And we don't tell them how to do that. Normative references, there aren't any. Um, that was required to be added by ISO to fit their format for standards. So we have a blank section there. Um, then terms and definitions. Make sure you understand the terms and definitions because things get you in trouble like um, I mentioned about FMEA. FMEA is a different set of terms and definitions. Their, term, uh, their definition of risk is different. It is the um, probability of occurrence of a failure and the severity of the effect of the failure. It is not the probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of harm. It's different. Um, the general requirements for a risk management system, it's part of a quality management system. And we use the word system now in connection with this as it's a, a requirement for the MDR and the IBDR to have a risk management system. So clause four tells you what that is. So you understand uh, when the uh, um, uh, auditor comes in uh, for the MDR, uh, what, what a system is. Risk analysis is the most misapplied requirement for the misuse of tools. There's more than one tool required to do a good risk analysis. You, uh, there's a new one for usability, for instance, usability, um, related risk analysis, uh, which is much better than uh, uh, use FMEA. Uh, and uh, you need to uh, apply a number of, of different tools. Probably the most important one is preliminary risk analysis, which can be done even uh, clear back as early as clinical trials before uh, in, in uh, where you're doing your research, before you're applying design controls, you can use PHA. 
Risk evaluation, you must apply individual risk, risk, risk acceptability criteria um, during the risk evaluation stage. Um, so that means you have to have a criteria for individual risk that needs to appear in your plan, okay? The risk controls, risk controls are design inputs for safety requirements. This is where that requirement in uh, 1345 comes from. When you uh, develop a risk control, that becomes a design input. It becomes a safety requirement for your product. That's where that appears. Um, clause eight, evaluation of overall residual risk, a benefit to risk analysis. This is a difficult concept. The FDA has done the best job anybody has in their um, uh, guidance documents. They have four guidance documents on benefit to risk. Um, we do have some good um, uh, information in uh, ISO TR 24971-2020 edition, um, but uh, the uh, FDA expanded on that. So they've got some good examples in their documentation. Um, clause 10 is the biggest change to the third edition. You can no longer wait around for the uh, phone to ring uh, on complaints. You need to be actively going out and looking for information related to the performance of your product. You need to be searching on the internet for any information that is flowing out there uh, in different groups and so on. You need to be looking at uh, clinical literature. Then there's uh, three annexes, but annexes are not requirements of the standard, but they are guidance, okay? So those are the only requirements, clause one through 10. Um, clause four, I mentioned, uh, that uh, we have a risk management process. Uh, we It's a closed loop process. The management responsibility section, the competence of personnel. It requires a documented team of various disciplines that can provide judgment and decision-making. This is the one I was talking about earlier. We need to have these experts to do this. Um, we need to have a risk management plan, but it needs to be for each product or product family. Okay, um, and that's where you put the uh, risk uh, uh, acceptability criteria, both the individual and the overall. The risk management file, you need to have a file for each product or product family. It provides the traceability for all documentation of the entire process, and that's where the requirement for traceability is documented. You need to look at that carefully. The risk management file, uh, can be a distributed file um, because uh, we may have multiple sites involved. Um, but ultimately, the person whose name is on the product is responsible for that risk management, for the complete risk management file, regardless if you have used a contract manufacturer, a contract designer, or um, who it is. All of those documents need to be uh, accessible by the people that own the product, that are distributing the product. Okay, the risk analysis, uh, does it comply with 14971? You need to make sure it does. Um, you need to talk about intended use and reasonably foreseeable misuse. You need that clinical medical input and regulatory involvement there uh, to look at that intended use. Um, and then, of course, the usability people to to uh, understand any reasonably foreseeable misuse. Um, identification of characteristics related to safety. Look at Annex A of 24971. Um, that's uh, where those example questions are. I forgot to put the reference to, it's in 24971, not in 14971. 24971 is the guidance document with all the uh, information uh, for the standard for application of the standard. Lots of examples in there, great tool. Um, and you better have it, if you don't have it, get it. Identifications of hazards and hazards situation, normal conditions, all hazards, I mentioned that, not just single fault, uh, need more tools than one, read this section closely. Uh, risk estimation, the probability of harm and the severity of harm, not hazard. Um, and then uh, the most changed part of the 2019 edition, you have a general section which sets the stage and then information collection 
I mentioned active process. You must go look for information and you need to look on the internet because the FDA is, believe me, and other regulators as well. What is the information telling you about the risk performance of your product? So you need to review that information that you collect to find out what's going on. And then actions, do you need to do anything? What do you need to do? How urgent is the action needed? This is an immediate recall. What is going on? And look at both the product itself and your risk management process. Is there a defect in your risk management process that needs to be corrected? You can learn that from your information review. So look at both the product and the risk management process when you do that review. Um, so for any risk management process, uh, we need to start early. Should begin by the time of the design plan creation, maybe even during concept and certainly if any clinical trials, that's when you need to start risk analysis because clinical trials require it. Okay, uh, remember the output of risk management is design input, I mentioned that. So the end of recognition of 14971 2007 is December, 2022. You need to scrub all of your documentations and remove any references to any earlier editions. You should have either the ISO 2019 or the EN 2019 or both uh, involved. And the EN version needs to include the uh, Annex 11, which was uh, 2021. So uh, now uh, we've got 11 questions. So I've got something to start with here and we'll go through those. Um, you seem to have, well, I, I already looked at that one. And if it's easier, I'd be happy to um, yes, would you them please? out to you so you don't have to joggle back and forth there. Yeah, would you Perfect. please? I know we answered a couple of them at the beginning, right. so we'll go down um, further along the ones. So one question that we had come in, um, does everything based on FMEA need to be replaced? I did hear your comment about FMEA only covering single faults. No, it doesn't need to be replaced. FMEA is a really good tool. It's a check tool because it requires design output to do it. So you can't do design, um, uh, you can't um, do FMEA before design input. It's, it has, you have to have the design um, characteristics done before you can do it because you're analyzing components and subassemblies and so on. So it's a check tool that you do after you've got the design outputs to make sure that you haven't missed any hazards. But again, you got to move from the idea that it, it's a uh, fault. Uh, it's a single fault standard. So it's going to miss some things possibly. So um, F fault tree analysis is a, a tool that will get all uh, uh, causes of a, uh, a fault. So um, it's you, you, a lot of people use fault tree and FMEA together, and that gives a better coverage. Um, I, and then uh, what's the next one then? So, well, one, and I also have some comments to add to this one as well. We're getting asked that on slide 21, you mentioned a great guidance document, and they're just asking if you can repeat what guidance document there is. I was going to say, we also have a lot of great guidance documents as well. If you just kind of Google some differences between FMEA and ISO 14971, that's how I learned the difference. But I'm sure, Ed, you can also make some recommendations. Well, there. here's the reference page right here. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, Mike Schmidt, who was a uh, uh, co, uh, he, he and I worked together for many years. And Mike wrote this in 2004. Unfortunately, he passed away um, because this is a uh, uh, an important article on FMEA. Um, it's it's certainly dated, but uh, still has a lot of good points. Um, then uh, there's a um, article on bringing clarity to risk acceptability um, that I wrote uh, and uh, closing loop on risk management, which is on the uh, clause 10, and then uh, benefit risk and benefit risk. Uh, those were all based on 
the 2019 version. All of those articles are available at Med Device Online. Okay. And then um, previous. Don't want to do that. There. Um, a criteria for risk acceptability that Stan wrote um, the chapter in our book uh, on on risk acceptability. It's a that's a very difficult topic. It's a good explanation. Um, Nancy Levison had a great book on looking at things from a systems point of view because that's what we need to do. We need to be looking from a, a systems point of view on risk management. We need to be looking uh, from the patient and user perspective, not from the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get some hate and discontent, but not from the, the design perspective, but from the user perspective and looking backwards into the thing and decomposing down into those lowest individual components. So our, our risk uh, criteria needs to, our risk system needs to be built thinking about the patient, the user, uh, the property and the environment. And the reason I say property now is cybersecurity is a requirement now of 14971, cyber, cyber and data security risk. So those are um, things that um, Nancy wrote a, a great book on system safety. Uh, and then uh, two new books that have just come out, Foundations of Quality Risk Management by Jayat Moon, uh, from ASQ. That's a more general um, uh, document on quality risk management, which is uh, um, includes the business risk stuff. But um, Bijan Elahai uh, wrote the book Safety Risk Management for Medical Devices, specifically on medical devices. It's the second edition. It's brand new. It's just been updated. It's an excellent book. Both of them are good. Um, just remember, JS, you got to sort out the business risk stuff and see what applies to medical devices. But um, uh, Dijon's book is, is fantastic. So now here's the three documents from ISO. The first is 14971. Okay. The second one is the technical report or the guidance document on uh, application of 14971. And that is ISO TR 24971 2020. Okay, that was released in June of 2020. Um, and there, uh, that version is the same uh, around the world. So you don't need to look up an EN version. There's nothing different in that document. Okay, certainly um, we know the EN version of 14971 and the amended EN version and the ISO version. So there's three different possibilities out there, but there's only one version of 24971. It's 85 pages of guidance with examples. It's tremendous. It's really important document. And then of course, I mentioned uh, ISO 1345, the uh, quality management systems uh, standard, which the FDA is uh, going to uh, reference in the um, uh, quality, uh, 20, 21 CFR 820 uh, regulation um, coming up someday. They've released the proposal. It's uh, gone through the comment period. So uh, when they finish analyzing the comments and coming up with uh, their responses, they will publish a proposed um, uh, draft of or a, uh, no, they, they, they did the proposed. It will be the final draft um, and uh, publish that online. Um, who knows, maybe in 2023. We'll hopefully. see. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Uh, so it'll simplify our lives. But, so those are the reference documents we have. More questions? Absolutely. We have a lot more coming in, so we'll see how many we can get to. Um, and by the way, if, if uh, we don't get them all covered today, I'm going to ask that... Uh, uh, like the last time we did this at, at Greenlight, they go ahead and compile them and send them to me. And as I get time, I will email responses out. Wonderful. From everybody, thank you, because we have more than 20 questions coming in. So we got about 10 minutes left, so we'll get to as many as possible. But following up with those, I'm sure everyone would very much appreciate it. Um, 
keeping us moving here though, we had a wonderful question come in coming in that asks, how do you feel about other standards repeating definitions from one another or from ISO 14971? For example, IEC 62304, um, is that good practice over the long run or should those standards just reference back to 14971? Well, uh, that's an ISO um, formatting uh, system. That is, uh, that's the way that you have to do things under ISO. So I will not have an opinion on that. <laughs> the problem that comes up, and I'm sure what you're referring to, is when the editions change, because the 62304 is based on the 2007 edition and not the 2019 edition um, in their reference. So they're referring to an old set of definitions. And I understand that. Um, but um, uh, ISO says that if you use the term uh, from another standard uh, to uh, make sure they they uh, coordinate um, you have to uh, put that in the uh, in the ISO, ISO standards that you're creating wonderful thank you this is another great question that's come in asking what does the auditor look for as far as documentation of personnel qualifications should you have specific training on ISO 14971 um, what experience would you recommend someone have um, yeah, the auditors, uh, one of the things I found is that every auditor is different. Every auditor looks at things from their own personal experience and perspective, as well as any training that they've had along the line. But uh, my best reference would be to uh, actually to uh, 13485, because that's where the uh, competency requirement comes in uh, for personnel. Um, under the quality management system standard, they have a, a, a set of requirements there and where you would normally document those um, is in the personnel file. So you would go to maybe a resume, um, training that you've received, um, any um, job experience that you've had somewhere, those kinds of things would be in your personnel file. And that's where typically a um, uh, auditor would go to look for um, competency information. So uh, um, just make sure that you've you've got everything on the resume that that is in your personnel file. And you may want to um, ask if you can see your file and go through it and um, and make sure that everything is in it. And if anything is not, then provide the if something is not there, then provide that document to um, HR to make sure it gets in your personnel file uh, for that purpose. Okay. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. I'll answer a couple of questions that came in. So yes, the presentation that Ed has been sharing with us will be made available as well as the recording from today. Um, once the virtual summit is over, you'll find that on the virtual summit page. So you can certainly look out for that recording and these slides should you want to come back and especially go to any of these references that Ed was talking about previously. Um, now, for the easy questions that I got to answer, another question for you, Ed, is someone is asking, what is your opinion on EU requirements that the risk should be decreased as far as possible? How would you go about implementing that? Well, the first thing you do is if you got to have a risk, if you have a risk chart with red, yellow, and green on it, you have a problem because uh, auditors in the EU don't like the term acceptability. OK, um, what they're looking for is some indication that you have applied risk controls until um, the point where a risk control doesn't reduce risk anymore. So just because you've got one risk control out there doesn't mean you're done. Now, by that uh, converse of that, I would have a risk chart that doesn't have any colors on it, doesn't have any acceptability on it because I want to plot on there my risk to see, okay, how much did that risk control reduce it? And, and trying to get it down to the bottom line. That's what the, the uh, EU wants, everything to be at the zero line or the, well, it's not zero, but the bottom line there. Um, so they're looking for uh, you continuing to uh, try to add risk control measures until you find that it no longer 
uh, reduces risk or that it negatively impacts the benefit to risk. Now, interestingly enough, one of the benefits is product availability. So if your risk control measure drives the cost of the product up to the point that it can't be produced uh, and sold, then that product's not available. So you have impacted the benefit to risk ratio by not making that product available as a benefit. So there's, there's a lot of nuances to their uh, way of doing things. But um, uh, first thing is, is don't say anything about acceptability. Um, acceptability is only until uh, a risk control doesn't reduce the risk anymore. Okay, and you, you need to um, uh, use the design choice first. Um, the second choice is uh, the precautions choice. Um, after you've done all the design things you could do, then you do precautions. And then finally, uh, you'd use information for safety, which is accepted as a risk control measure in Europe. But if you use information for safety, it must be validated in your usability validation exercise to make sure, in fact, that that um, information for safety does reduce the risk down to the level you estimated. Okay. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so one, a question that came in, and this is one of my favorite questions that I get asked as well, and I'll expand on their question a little bit here, is asking, do we have to conduct risk, conduct risk assessments at each stage of developing a medical device? And kind of to expand on that for my own, just because I would love to hear how you explain it as well, Bill, when should you start risk management? Okay, I would start risk management at concept development. Okay. Um, I would develop a single risk analysis document, uh, which is a risk summary table, uh, kind of an approach, and it uh, provides for traceability in it. But I would update that throughout the life of the product. So every time I go to a stage in development, I would go look and see if there's any new risks in, uh, inserted in the product or in the production process, okay? And during those steps, I would be going back and updating my risk analysis with new information that I've gained. I will gain some new information at um, usability validation um, and design validation, uh, because at that point, I'm going to be making sure that the risk, uh, estimates that I have are accurate. That is, that when I use that product in, with real people, with real patients, in fact, that the guesses that I made, and that's what they are during design, the guesses on risk estimates are, in fact, validated when I do my exposure to patients and design validation and and uh, usability validation, and even beyond that, out in the field. The, the feedback information that I get in the post-production, uh, production and post-production information section needs to go back into that risk analysis and update it one more time. All of the risks need to be in a single risk analysis, whether it's software, whether it's biocompatibility, whether it's electrical safety, if it's cybersecurity, all those need to be in one uh, file, one risk analysis document. Absolutely. Wonderful, Bill. Well, unfortunately, that does take us at time here. What an amazing session. Once again, from myself and everyone else on the call or on our webinar here with us today, thank you, Ed, so much. Your expertise is extremely valuable to absolutely everyone. We also have our 2023 State of the MedTech Industry Survey out right now. Be sure to take the survey for a chance to win $100 or to donate $100 to Project Cure. We've gone ahead and dropped the link in the chat for you, so make sure you give that a click. The final session for today will be starting here shortly. We will be hearing about the EMDR program and processes. Please join us at the top of the hour. But once again, Ed, thank you so much for a very valuable session here. We'll send over all of those questions that we weren't able to get to. There were so many good ones. We could only answer a couple, but we'll make sure we send those over to you as well. But otherwise, thank you so much. Thank you all.
Appreciate the opportunity.